and very godly. Um, today we are all together and we are um, joining together in the Tavern of Love. That's what Rumi used to call it. And the wine that is being poured on us is the divine grace of God. And uh, the Saki is the one who pours the wine, um, the one who gives the blessings, which is the master. And the cup is like the body, the body and the mind. And uh, in Rumi's poetry, it's like he used to say that not even for one moment do I know what I'm going to say because I'm like a pen in the writer's hand and I, I, like a, a flute, like a flute in the performance uh, hands. Like a, a, and if you want God to use you, you have to be empty like a flute from within. And once you are empty, then God can use you like an instrument and music can flow out of you and poetry can flow out of you and beautiful words can float out of you just like my master Santakar Singh whenever he speaks his voice is so mellow so subtle so beautiful so relaxing so smoothing that you can fly up to God up to the kingdom of God just on his subtle voice the voice of God the voice of the kingdom of God and uh, the, 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 the looks of the master's eye, like when Ishwar, when Ishwar looks at us, just a flow of love comes out of the eyes of, of Satpursh, the eyes of God. And it is so, so, so soothing and so elating and makes your soul wants to jump around and do somersaults and, and just like cannot hold itself because it has met the oversoul. This is what happens to us when we... Uh, read poetry from the perfect masters, hear their words, their jewels, those jewels that have been poured on us that are timeless and are a treasure house just to help all humanity. Um, so I, I wanted the, I, uh, to uh, um, tell you the story of Rumi because I, I'm sure you, uh, you heard it, but his master, his name was Shams. Shams in Arabic means sun, like the sun. So Shams was a dervish, wandering dervish, and he used to go from one place to another. And one day he prayed to God, Lord Almighty, and he said, I want a companion of yours, a lover of yours to be, to be my companion. One of your, one, a God man to be my companion where I can recite the tale of love, the tale of separation, the agony of separation, and the joy of union. I want to have a friend. I want to have a friend to tell him all these stories. Somebody who is worthy of you. Somebody who is your true lover. And Lord God Almighty within answered him and said, my son, your wish will be granted. However, there is a price. And you know what the price is. You have to give your head to the master. You have to sacrifice your head to the master. We all have to do that at one point. Sacrifice everything for the master to gain well, you, when you surrender, then the surrender, when you surrender, then whoever you surrender to will have to, will, have, will have to give you everything, will have to take care of you, and you become his. You become his. When you surrender, that's it. Then everything becomes yours from the one who you surrender to. So, so Shams surrendered to our Lord Almighty, and then he was led from within to the city of Konya, where there was a renowned professor of philosophy who was known all over and he used to have gatherings and they used to talk intellectually about, uh, about uh, divine knowledge. And uh, when he met, uh, when, uh, when Shams went to meet Rumi, he, Rumi was sitting next to a pool, a pool of water. And he was pondering with his eyebrows crooked like this, you know, uh, looking, looking like deeply at some manuscripts. And then uh, Shams told him, uh, my dear scholar, what is taking your attention so, so, uh, so much? Can you please tell me? And he said, uh, yes, sure, I will tell you. These are manuscripts that have divine knowledge in them. And, and uh, even the scholars, it's insoluble. Un un understandable for even the eminent scholars and I'm trying to solve them. That's why. And then he looked at Shams and he said, yes, and these are beyond your understanding, my dear. Uh, you know, he looked uncouth. 
he looked, uh, you know, shovel because he had like tattered clothes and stuff like that. He was wandering from one place to another, shams. And he said, you know, they are beyond the understanding of a common man. They need somebody with extreme intellect, extreme intellect to understand them. And Shams looked at him and smiled and he said, oh yeah, here, let me see. And he, then he took, the, he took the books from, from, uh, from Rumi and, and, and he threw them. And, and they were, as they were in the air and he, he told Rumi, you know, divine knowledge is not found in books. <laughs> and then Rumi saw the books go into the water and he became so sad. He did become angry, but he became so sad. And he said, oh, <laughs> he said, hey, you dervish. <laughs> Uh, what have you done? You have wasted the treasure house. You have wasted the treasure house that all humanity has lost because of you. That humanity has lost this treasure house of divinity because of your acts. And then uh, Shams looked at him and smiled again. And he just put his hand in the water and got the books. And the books were not even wet. And he gave them back to Rumi. And Rumi was like so stunned. He couldn't even talk. But he could see that a new horizon of knowledge a new horizon of knowledge has opened unto him and he could explore that new divinity, that new path of enlightenment that he has been just shown, just from a small example that he has been shown. And then he was so attracted to Shams, he fell in love with Shams, he got initiated and you know afterwards, you know the story afterwards, like how all the disciples of Rumi started to Ridiculing, ridicule him because he fell in love with that wandering dervish, the poor, uh, uncouth, uh, wandering dervish. He fell in love with, and he started to write his poetry for Rumi. And his poetry came from God, and it was about all his spiritual. Um, it was about all his spiritual journey. You know, you know about the journey, how we go through so many things, so many things, and we learn every day, every day on the path of love. On, the, on this path, on this holy path, every day is a learning and every day is an experience. And he wrote so much poetry, so much poetry just came pouring, pouring, pouring out of his mouth. It was pouring out of the mouth of God. He was just using him. And it's all about the union, the separation. Like when Rumi speaks about the, 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 um, the rain, he means separation from God and the agony. And then when he, in his poetry, when he speaks about uh, the spring, it's about the awakening of the soul, about the awakening of the soul, that it starts to now rise in different horizons and get the knowledge of God. And when he talked about Shams, he talked about Shams with so much love and Shams was a new dawning on his life, that an awakening, that knowledge of God, knowledge of the kingdom of God has started to dawn and to, to, to just flood him, flood Rumi with, uh, when Shams appeared into his life. And the same thing when Santakar Singh appeared in my life, my whole life was upturned, flipped around, and my whole direction of life has, has totally changed. And, then, and then, then, you know, it's a journey step by step where you learn every day because first you are a baby on the path. You are a, a, a baby crawling on his knees. And then as time passes by and you keep the commandments of the master and the master abides in you and you abide in the master and, and you serve the master. You go through so many, so many steps, so many steps, so many steps. Uh, and even after many, many years, uh, Rumi, uh, uh, Hafiz, in his poetry, spoke about uh, those steps and how about after so many years, he was still a, a, a child in God. That, that this journey, we have to be very patient because it's a long, long journey that the potter has to, uh, to make you into a perfect pot before he pours the nectar in that he has to clean everything, he has to polish everything, and he has to make you totally empty, just like a flute. So music can flow, music can flow out of you. So this journey is a long journey, and we have to be patient and keep, keep holding the master's hand, no matter what, no matter what kind of information we get from this negative world about the master, about the mission of the master, or about, you know, there is always, always, always stuff going on in this negative world trying to knock you off the path of love, off the path of God, off the path of the kingdom of God. And you have to keep your feet steady, steady in master, steady in God, and always live in his fort, live in his protection, and always keep, keep, keep your attention on master as much as much as possible. And what will happen to you? 
all love will be poured on you. Your whole life will be a grace, a life of grace, a life of blessing, a life of God, a life of the kingdom of God, a life of intoxication. As Rumi, when he speaks about the wine, he speaks about getting drunk, getting drunk in God. And what is getting drunk in God? It is to lose yourself in the love of God. You lose yourself in God. You lose yourself in the love of God and then you become intoxicated in God. You become drunk. You become drunk and, and that drunkness, the saints and masters talk about that it could last, it could last forever. It could last forever. That we are to tread this path so, so we at some point we will reach the ultimate destination. When we reach the ultimate destination, then we will be always drunk in God and we will be always happy. And before you reach the destination, it is like, like a, when you hear music from far, you can still hear the music. It is coming from far. Like if a drum is coming from far, you can still f hear it. And if there is a fire a little bit far away from you, you can still feel the heat. So, you, so this, this journey, even though we have not reached the destination, we still feel the warmth of the fire that is far. We, feel, we still hear the drum from far away and this drum and we keep walking towards the sound, walking towards God, walking towards the kingdom of God, ultimately the floodgates will open on all of us and we will be drowned in God and we will be drowned in the kingdom of God. And that's what I wish on myself that one day I will reach the final destination. I will just melt in God and just just live in God and be with God and and God, God, God will be my life. This is, I wish that on you, I wish that on myself. And uh, since we talked about Rumi, I would like to read a poem of Rumi. Uh, usually Asim is here and she reads to us. I'm going to call her uh, uh, Rumi Asim. Maybe in her past life she was with Rumi. She always reads to us from Rumi. But I'm sure she will read for us soon. Uh, uh, let me see. Oh my soul, where can I find rest but in the shimmering love of his heart? Where can I see pure light of the sun? but in the eyes of my own shams of the breeze. And where can we find rest now? We have a perfect master. We have Ishwar Puri. We can only find rest in his feet, in his eyes, in his company, in his remembrance. Moment by moment, think of the perfect master. And the perfect master is there. One time, Ishwar held my hand and said, Michael, whenever you think of me, I am there. Yes. Okay, another, another part. Be off and know that the way of lovers is opposite all other ways. Lies from the friend are better than truth and kindness from others. For him, the impossible is commonplace. Punishment is reward. Tyranny is justice. Slander is the highest praise. His harshness is soft. His blasphemy is sacred. The blood that drips from the beloved's thorn is sweeter than roses and basil. When he is bitter, it's better than a candy shop. When he turns his head away, it's all hugs and kisses. When he says, my God, by God, I've had enough of you. It's like an eternal spring flowing from the fountain of life. A no from his lips is a thousand times yes. On this selfless path, he acts like a stranger, yet he's your dearest friend. His infidelity is faith. His tones are jewels. His holding back is giving. His ruthlessness is mercy. You may laugh at me and say, the path you're on is full of curves. Yes, the curves of his eyebrow. <laughs> I have traded in my soul. The scurvy path has gotten me drunk. I can't say another word. Carry on, my glorious heart. Finish the poem in silence. O Shams, Lord of the breeze, what sweetness you pour on me, upon me. All I need do is open my mouth and all your songs flow out. Oh, oh my God, this glorious poem. I, ah, just treasure house coming out of the mouth of God, living in Rumi. And the, the wine of God, Rumi talks about the wine of God, that it's tastier, tastier than the, sumptu the most sumptuous meal in this whole universe. Even the cork that covers the bottle, 
that is over God's wine is intoxicated. <laughs> anyway, I guess now it's time to play master and enjoy enjoy his words, enjoy the treasure house that comes out of his words. And I just chose something this morning uh, by uh, uh, by random, and uh, I didn't even listen to it or anything like that. So we will listen together for 20 minutes, and then we will meditate for like half an hour together. And then Master is going to pour his love on us, his wine. We're going to all get drunk in God. We're going we're gonna to all learn how to die. We're, we're all going to die of this world and dip into God's wine. So, okay, let me play Master. in someone else's story. <laughs> and, and then Ishwar will read the question again uh, when he repeats it. When souls pick destinies at causal plane, how do they coordinate with other souls? Or are other players in our story just created experience? How do we know that we are not an experience in someone else's story? When souls pick destinies at causal plane, how do they coordinate with other souls or other players in our story just created experiences? How do we know that we are not an experience in someone else's story? Correct answer, there is no someone else. There is only one self. All other selves are created by one self. There is one soul. All souls are created from one soul and are within that one soul. It is just an experience of the many within one soul. This experience, which I can't call experience because not in time, takes place in your true home. True home gives you the real truth that there is only one total consciousness, never split, is still total, remains total. And the experience of the many souls is the experience of one soul. And each one of us right now, thinking we are all separated, are participating in that one soul. We never left it. When will you discover that? Go not only above the mind, go about the individuated souls. That is the true home where you discover the whole show. What's happening here is happening there. Nothing is happening anywhere else except within that one soul. All rest is created by that one soul. There are no others to coordinate with. It looks strange right now, sitting in this physical world, we are so many people. How can we be one? We are not. One in that sense, as an experience, we are many. The experiencer is one. When you have a dream at night, and you see many people there, and you ask each other, are we all dreaming, or only one is dreaming? They say, no, how can all be dreaming? We are all together here. You wake up, only one dreamer. All the others were part of the same dream. It's identical to that. When you, supposing you think that this journey, spiritual journey, awareness is waking up, a series of wakefulnesses, because we have been got into deep sleep, one dream, then the dream took place within the dream, then dream took place within the dream. We have had six levels of dreams. The last level is right here, but maybe there's one more, maybe two more dreams within dreams we can even have now. When you wake up, all the people you saw, all the objects you saw, everything you saw was part of your one dreamer, just part of one dream. If you wake up, it will again be one dream but many other dreamers. You wake up again, one dream with many others and finally one dreamer, no others, all others were part of the dream. So that is why there is no problem of coordination at all. It's a complete creation every time we are here. This was such a big problem for me, not talking of souls, I was talking of karma. 
that when we say we have karma with people and we come back and meet the same people again, I was thinking what kind of computer that lot of death or lot of birth, rebirth is working on that he can tie up thousands of people we meet now and then he can readjust that they can all come back again in our life again just to pay off karma. It's very difficult. Here they have in the lottery, they give uh, I think six numbers and there are millions of choices of numbers. And sometimes one person, sometimes nobody wins a lottery because the odds are so much against just finding out six numbers out of 80. It looks very simple, but it's very difficult. Look at the odds that will be trillions and trillions of that odds of having the same number of people coming together for, um, for getting their karma paid off. It took me a long time to realize when we come, we think they are the same people, we create the same people. Each one carries a complete universe, including the karma that plays out. It's within the same totality of consciousness, and that is why there's no coordination needed at all. It's your own experience that you generated, and when you meet people, it's part of your experience. It's cause and effect is applying to your experience. There's nobody else to share that experience. Are there any others? Eventually you'll find out there was no other. <laughs> the self that you are feeling inside you right now, the self that is making you see this world is the same self. That's totality. Let me give you an example. Supposing you have a dream. In the dream, you are young, very small. You see, I am a little child. I, I thought I was a big person. How to become a child? In a dream you can do that. Is that child in the dream the same self? That's the big one who's dreaming or different? You'll see the body's child, the self is the same. The self that is awake in dream remains the same self, no matter whether it's change of form or not. And that is why there was, I gave the example of a Chinese philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly. Fahin dreamt that he was a butterfly and he was flying in a garden which looked so much different, so much more real than the gardens he had seen. The flowers were alive, radiating light and color. He had never seen them before. He was flipping around with his wings as a butterfly, seeing that garden. And he said, this is reality compared to what he saw as a human being. And then he woke up to the dream. He then began to wonder, am I really far he a human being who had a dream that he was a butterfly or am I really a butterfly who's now dreaming that I am far he? He told his friends, he was a philosopher, he consulted other philosophers, he said, I had such a strange dream that I was a butterfly. They said, don't be stupid, you can't be a butterfly, you're a human being. You should say you saw a butterfly. He said, I never saw a butterfly. I was flying. The same self that is Swaheen was the same butterfly and the self could not be changed. You'll be surprised no matter what condition you are, dreaming, awake, higher levels, highest level, same self. Self will never change. What will happen will be you realize the dreamlike nature of creation, and you ultimately find you are that one who created all. There's nothing outside of it. So there is no question of coordination. If you know the truth, it's all happening within one totality of consciousness, one single consciousness. I don't want to use the word single because that means there may be more than one. There is no more than one. That's where we really want to, you have everything there. Some people think we have come away from there, that we have, we dropped from there into this physical world and we have to go back there and the physical world won't be there. Nothing is outside of that. A perfect living master is one who is operating even as a human being from there. So therefore he is in contact with all levels of consciousness 24-7. 
He's not remembering something that he had experienced. That is all mental. A perfect living master is in touch with all levels of consciousness, including totality at all times. Therefore, he knows this is part of the same. Everything that is happening at any level of consciousness is all happening within that one. So that is why it's only a mental question we ask here because we think we are really divided. That's what we see. That's what we experience. Experience of many has been generated. Why? Because consciousness is conscious of an experience and experience is separated from the consciousness in order to become an experience. Otherwise, it remains an experiencer. When the experiencer has an experience, the manyness is created right there. Purpose of the manyness, if one is love, and I mentioned that, people say God is love. The creator is love. I've heard that in almost every religion, that the creator is love. But it is love, but not the experience of love. The manyness creates the experience. Love becomes an experience. Knowledge becomes an experience. Everything that is in the one, in totality of consciousness, becomes an experience by creating the many. And the many are first created at that very level. So in our true home, we are one and many at the same time because there is no time. And you can experience both. That's a unique experience. You can't have it here. You can't have it at the astral plane. You can't have it at the causal plane. You can't have it at the spiritual plane. You can have it at the top. At the top, you get the real experience where the one and the many are experienced together. Now, somebody who's having that experience sitting amongst us, supposing comes like a human being, ordinary human being sits with us, we can never have any idea what that person's experiencing. What is, it's not an experience even. What is knowing? What is aware of? And awareness is completely total. And that is why when you have that awareness, you come to know the truth. The truth is there is only one consciousness. And within that consciousness, everything has been created as experience, including the manyness, including the minds, including the separation, including physical planes. And when you reach there, everything is put together. Has it gone above the head or still here? <laughs> Does mechanical Simran, done while walking around and going about your day, draw one, draw one closer to the master in love? Or is it that mechanical repetition a distraction to experiencing that love? Does mechanical Simran done while walking around and going about your day draw one closer to the master in love or is that mechanical repetition a distraction to distraction to experience that love it depends on what we mean by mechanical simran simran is repetition of words it's a language that we have learned here, no matter what the words are, no matter what language it is, they are created words for this physical plane. They can be repeated here. And they can also be repeated in our imagination. They can be repeated by the mind in, in imaginary state and in physical state. Thoughts can be in words. These are words that can only be used in these levels. Words have meaning when we say this person speaks Deutsch, speaks German language, they speak English language, a different languages. German guy, guy can't understand what's in English. Englishmen can't understand German. One step higher in the state of imagination, the state of astral communication, one person communicates in German, the other person understands in English. Automatic translation. Why is that? Because the method of communicating at that level is telepathic. Sometimes we have that experience here. It's not happening because of here. Physically, there is no means to translate language automatically. But when telepathic communication takes place, 
somebody thinks of a thought in one language, the friend gets the same telepathic thought in that language. It's automatic because what is transferred is not words, the meaning of words, what is intended to be said. And that is the normal communication, the next level of awareness. So that is why these words have very limited use here. They drop off and other sounds and other kinds of communications come up when we leave the body and we go into astral and causal planes. And of course, there's no language except love beyond that. Repetition of the Simran or words that have been given as a mantra by a master are good to develop a habit. Words repeated with the tongue have not much value. The words repeated by the mind have value because when you repeat the words of the mind, mind can't think of anything else when you're trying to force the mind to repeat the words. It's a means of concentrating your attention on the mind, on the words. It's just a means of concentrating attention. Mind also has a habit forming tendency. It forms habits if you keep on doing the same thing. Mechanical repetition of words is useful to the extent that the mind forms a habit. And when is that habit useful? When you meditate, the mind has got habitual, so it will start repeating the word by itself. Otherwise, it is not a great step towards spiritual awareness. It only has a limited advantage. But while you are repeating the words, not mechanically, but remembering the master, remembering these words were given by the master, and most importantly, when you are remembering the words in the master's own voice, it really brings love and devotion in your heart. So that is why there are different ways in which we can do our Simran and repeat the words. The best is sit quietly and do meditation or walk and be aware of the words of the master ringing in your head. That is why initiates of perfect living masters have been given that initiation and the words to repeat by the master, human form of the master in his own voice. And that voice when you capture and recall it, the best similar, there's nothing like it. It comes with love and devotion automatically because you are remembering the master. Do you know, if you can remember the master without repeating words, it's better than mechanical repetition of words. But if you can link the words with the love and devotion for the master, the best way to do the similar. So remember, mechanical repetition has some value that at the time of meditation, the mind will pick up quickly. And the real value is when the repetition reminds you of the master. And when the repetition is a memory recall of master's language, master's voice, it's the best repetition. <clears throat> Dearest adorable master. I no have, master. Okay. I have a confusion on the relation of sound meditation with developing love and devotion. In some satsangs, you said the Shabd is our true self and connecting with it connects to our self and God. But then sometimes you say that no meditation of any kind connects us to God or home. So I feel there is a contradiction. Please, if you can explain. Okay, I'll remove the contradiction today. <laughs> I just explained in the morning that the self never changes. The self remains the same. All other is experience. Can we have an experience of the self if there was no other experience? Does the experiencer have an experience of the experiencer without any other experience? So that, he, that the existence of consciousness is automatic by itself. Yes, it is. The consciousness is aware of itself at all times. The self never loses the consciousness of itself. You all know the self is there. You are thinking, you are using a mind to think, using senses to work, you are using a body. Self is constantly known to us. Therefore, 
The self knows itself, but is there something experiencing the self? Yes, it is. The self can be experienced in physical plane like a sound coming from the self. And that's a very interesting thing. Sound coming from the self. Is it, it, we can call it meditation on the self. Normally, we do meditation around the self. We repeat, repeating words, thinking of master, making pictures, all around. But we do not have any experience of the self itself. The experience of the self is called Shabd, sound. It is a connected experience and does not go away from one level to another. I called it earlier, the self remains the same at all levels. The sound connects at all levels also. That means the sound is here, sound is there, sound in a different form is right to the top. Now I'll explain what the different form is. The form that the sound is being used here, outside, or we call it varad atmak shabd. That means sound that can be used for language, for speaking, writing, and so on. Which you're using now, I'm using it right now. To communicate with you, I have to use sound in a language. And this is called varan atmak shabd, or that which can be spoken, and that which can be written and communicated like this. But we don't need this as I explained in the astral plane. The thoughts can transfer the meaning without using this, these words. Then what kind of sound is there? There you have a sound that emanates from the self but resembles something else. Physically we want to go to the astral plane. If we can attach ourselves to the sound of the soul, we are pulling our attention back to the self and the other sound will start coming in. If you hear that sound, which is coming from the self and not hearing this side or that side, roaring trains or um, chirping crickets and little bells ringing, which are all around it. But the sound of the self is very interesting. It resembles the sound of a big bell. It's just a coincidence. That is why we don't realize why bells were put up on the belfries in the churches, why bells are rung in all the temples, why this kind of a sound is being used. When the bell sound is there, it does not come from any side. It comes from self and we are not aware where the self is. So it looks like it's all around us, like a surround sound. This is different sound than the spoken sound I'm using and continues to be a very major part, the astral plane. So instead of varanatmak shabd, we call it dhonatmak shabd. That means it's mostly a tone, a sound that's in the music of it is the sound, not the words that we make out of it. It's good enough there. It changes again. If we go from the astral plane, the causal plane, the sound is again from the self, but changes. And it looks like it's a sound that has already been there all the time. Here, if somebody now rings a bell, before that I was not hearing, now I'm hearing. In the causal plane, it look, we have been hearing it all the time. It's not that the sound is coming now. Sound was there all the time. I was hearing all the time at that level. I just blocked my ears and therefore I came into the physical and astral self and didn't hear it. It doesn't mean sound is not there. It's a very strange experience that you have a sound inside you at the causal plane, which is running all the time. And you know it's running all the time, as you go there, as you've been hearing it all the time there. In that self of yours, you're hearing all the time. Therefore, the dun atmak shabd has been termed in our Indian literature as anhad shabd. Anhad means it has no beginning, no middle, no end. It's infinite. Okay, my dear Holy Family, it's hard to stop Master from playing. Um, uh, so now it, it's time to meditate. And I was thinking, after 20 minutes, I don't have to wake you to get you out of meditation. What were you? What if you were in the kingdom of God, drinking the cup of nectar, and then you hear my voice bringing you down? So we'll meditate together, and in 20 minutes, um, 
in 20 minutes, I'll just, uh, or 25 minutes, I'll just come and uh, close Zoom, but we will be together and the, my uh, I'm gonna keep my video on, but I don't want to disturb you at the end. So after, after you finish meditation, I'm, uh, my words for you is that uh, I hope to see you tomorrow for another holy day in Holy Father God. And now it's time to meditate so we can uh, come up here to, uh, um, to, to the doorway of the kingdom of God where Ishwar is sitting and he has in his hand the cup of wine that he wants to give you. All what you have to do is keep your attention 100% on him, on Simran, try to listen to the Simran, listen to the words, do them uh, with the tongue of thought, with love and devotion, and, um, and at intervals, and uh, look into Ishwar's eyes and forehead, and let him give you the cup of wine. So I wish you the best meditation, and, um, and, um, and hopefully to see you tomorrow for another blessing. For when we meditate together, if you are going to go to sleep, it's going to be all afterwards godly dreams. And if you're going to start your day, it's going to be a very blessed day. So let's meditate and enjoy. <laughs>